let's say we want to graph, we're going to graph f of x comma y equal to, or let's go with one over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four. And we're going to graph, so we're, we're going to find all the things. We're going to find the domain, range, we're going to draw some traces, and some level curves. Is it Evan? Yes. Yes, awesome. Cool. All right. So if I'm graphing something and I'm being asked to find the domain and the range, that's what I'm going to find first, at least the domain, just to help me have an idea of what the graph is going to look like. Because I think thinking knowing the domain is a helpful thing to do. So if I think about domain here, I see kind of two issues in one. I see both, I don't want to be dividing by zero. And also the stuff inside of a square root had better be greater than or equal to zero. So I'm just going to kind of combine that into one condition and say, well, for domain, I know that the insides here of the square root x squared plus y squared minus four, normally I would say greater than or equal to zero. And since I know I don't want them to equal zero, I'm just going to say greater than zero. Now, I didn't say this a whole lot last time, but I should have in that when you're talking about domain of a function of two variables, if you see x squared plus y squared, or minus x squared minus y squared, you typically want to keep that all kind of together. It is a good unit on its own. You don't want to separate them from each other. So I'm going to rewrite this as x squared plus y squared greater than four. Now, we know that x squared plus y squared equal to four is a circle. Center is the origin. And the radius is square root of four, which is two. So if I want x squared plus y squared to be greater than four, well, here's how I can draw that. I'm going to draw the circle of radius two. And since I don't actually want to include that because I want x squared plus y squared to be greater than four, not equal to four, I'm going to draw that circle as a dashed circle to indicate that I'm not including it. And now that we've drawn that border is dashed or solid if we needed to include it, the question then becomes which side of it do we want? Do we want the insides or do we want the outsides? That is always the question. Once you've drawn a border in two dimensions and you're talking about domain, you always are going to be on one side of that border. The easiest way to check is just by picking any point that's not on the curve itself. Don't check the point two zero because that's on the curve. Check the point like zero zero. Does zero zero satisfy this inequality? Definitely not. I like to pick one that doesn't just to kind of point out that like it's not, but you could have picked three zero over here and three zero definitely would. If you find a point that doesn't satisfy it, you want everything on the other side. So you want everything that is outside of this circle of radius two. That's your entire domain. Now, do you need to do this? Only if you're asked to draw the domain. But if I'm going to write the domain, it's kind of anticlimactic. Domain here is the set containing all x and y such that x squared plus y squared is greater than four. It never really feels like when you're writing the domain, you've done much. You just said, well, yeah, there's the inequality I said had to be true. Now I'm saying it's all points so that that inequality is true. The range, on the other hand, is always, it's always a little dicey. So let's look at our function here and talk about the range. When I'm thinking range, I'm really just thinking how big and how small can my function get? So I've got a fraction. And I know that when I have fractions, fractions get big when the denominator gets really close to zero and fractions get small when the denominator gets really, really large. So I can think about here the fact that, well, that denominator can really get as large as I want it to be. I could let X be a billion and Y be 2 billion, and I would get one over something incredibly large, which would be super duper duper close to zero, but not equal to zero. So it looks like the range, the range can be almost as small as zero. So I would say that certainly my function F of X, Y, 
has a lower bound of zero, not inclusive. And then for the upper bound, well, I can make this fraction literally as large as I want to by letting say y be zero and x be really, really, really close to two. If x is very, so if, if y is zero and x is 2.000000, lots of zeros, one, that denominator is gonna be super small. And then when you do one divided by a super small number, it's gonna blow up. So this fraction can also be infinitely large. I will admit fully, there's not a lot of math I feel like going on when I do this. I'm just kind of talking it out to myself and saying, well, what can happen with this thing? How big can it get? Oh, he didn't believe it. How small can it get? Well, it can't be negative and it can't be zero. But there's really, there's not a whole ton of quote unquote math here. You could make this mathier if you really wanted to, but I don't think we really want to. Okay, so my range is everything from zero exclusive to infinity. Okay, let's talk about the actual graphing part. So I'm just gonna try and graph f of x, y equal to one over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four. And I will start out by pointing out that there is no trace in the xy plane. So the trace in the xy plane is non-existent because if we let d equal zero, this doesn't have a solution, right? Zero is not in the range. So there's no trace in the xy plane. And then let's talk about what's happening in each of the other two planes. So in the xz plane, that's where we're going to set y equal to zero. So if we do that, we're going to get, you can write f of x, y, or you can write z. I kind of like writing z because I'll think graph it better. I'm going to get z equal to one over the square root of x squared minus four. Um, I really have no idea what this looks like. Like, it's not like I couldn't figure it out with a little bit of work, but right off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with this. I do know that X needs to be bigger than two though. Because right? if X is two or smaller, the inside of this is gonna be like, I should really say X is be bigger than two or less than negative two. I'm thinking, okay, well, at two, getting a vertical asymptote. And at negative two, I'm also getting a vertical asymptote. And if X is really, really close to two, the function values are gonna be super duper big. And then as we move out to the right, we're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the same deal over here. Really, really close to negative two, we're going to be really big, and then we're going to go smaller, smaller, smaller like that. Good that this is kind of agreeing with the, oh my gosh, what's what I'm looking for? The range I already stated, right? If this is X and this is Z, it definitely looks like my range is as low as almost zero and as high as infinity. And then we can do the same thing for the YZ plane but it's gonna look the same. If we set X equal to zero, we're just gonna get Z equal to one over the square root of Y squared minus four. And when I graph that on the YZ plane, I feel like it's silly to even do it because it's gonna look literally the same. But I guess I could do it. What I've noticed is that when both of these look the same, you kind of have like a rotational thing going on. Like I can think of essentially, whoops, ooh taking this graph and rotating it around the z-axis to get sort of something kind of circular. And that's gonna be backed up by our level curves. The level curves specifically are what we do when we let z be values other than zero. I mean, zero is also a value, but like basically you let z be some constant. You're cutting this surface in three dimensions with horizontal planes. So like maybe my surface, but this surface kind of looks like a, weird volcano maybe, like kind of like this. And so if I start cutting that volcano with higher and higher planes, I'm gonna start getting smaller and smaller and smaller circles. But we can actually see this by just setting this function equal to constants that are in the range. So using all the paper here, talk level curves for a second. So it's kind of a long way and a fast way. Let's talk about the long way. So I've got f of x, y 
equal to one over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four. And I can pick level curves like z equal to one. If I do that, I've got one over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four equal to one, which isn't incredibly meaningful to me until I make it meaningful. I'm gonna multiply both sides by the denominator and say the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four equals one, and then square both sides, and then add four to both sides. So at a height of one, I get a circle with a radius of the square root of five. That is the origin. Now I could keep doing this work. I could go one higher and say z equals two, one over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four equals two. I don't know, multiply both sides by that, divide both sides by that so that one half equals the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four. Square both sides. And then add four over there. So if I go higher, I have a circle with a smaller radius. Now my radius, instead of being the square root of five, my radius is the square root of four and a quarter. So the idea here is that as we go higher and higher, my radii are getting smaller and smaller, but I don't want to do this like 10 times. And some of these people ask you literally to graph the level curves for maybe three or four or five values. So there's a general thing we do. Say, okay, we're just going to say pick z equal to some height of, say, c. c could be one or two or three or 10 or a thousand or whatever. And then we're going to solve this in the same sort of way. So we're going to say, okay, great. One over the square root of x squared plus y squared minus four equals c. And then we're going to solve for x squared plus y squared like we have every other time. So multiply both sides by x squared plus square root of x squared plus y squared minus four and divide both sides by c. So one over c equals the square root of x squared. If you don't like thinking of it that way, you can think of literally taking the reciprocal of both sides. The reciprocal of this side is equal to the reciprocal of that side. Square both sides, so one over c squared equals x squared plus y squared minus four. And if we add four over here, we get four plus one over c squared equals x squared plus y squared. And this is a circle centered at the origin. Radius is the square root of four plus one over c squared. So notably, as c gets larger and larger and larger, this radius gets closer and closer to two. And as C gets closer and closer to zero, this radius gets really, 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 really big. Like if C was really small, like one, 1,000, then you would have, I know you still have the four there. I guess the four is kind of boring it. So we don't really get, we actually can't get that big. Um, no, we can't, I lied, that's, that's not true. C, C can make, yeah. So if C was like one, one 1,000 is kind of big. If C was one 1,000, then this would be a thousand squared plus four, so you'd have the square root of thousand squared plus four, which is pretty close to a thousand. So C is super duper small, this radius gets really, really big. We can draw some of these level curves. So for example, right, when Z was equal to one or when C is equal to one, we have a radius of square root of five, which is a little bit bigger than two. Maybe we've got a circle that looks like that. And typically, when you're drawing level curves, you do label them. So this is C equal to one. So I'm up a height of one. And then if we go higher, our radius is going to be smaller. So when I go up to say Z equal to two, I'm going to get a radius of still bigger than two, but smaller than square root of five. I mean, this is where the drawings start to kind of fall apart. Because all of my all of my circles are going to have a radius that's bigger than two, and I can't really squeeze that many more in here. But the point is that essentially, as we go higher and higher and higher, our circles get closer and closer to, to having radius two. And if we pick a smaller value, like say c equal to one one thousand, well that's too big. Let's pick something more reasonable. Like let's say we pick c equal to I don't know maybe one third. Then the radius would be the square root of four plus 
one third squared is one ninth, one over one ninth is nine. Square root of 13 between three and four. So over here, this would be a level curve when C is equal to one third. So the height of one third, we have a big circle. We go higher up to a height of one, we have a smaller circle. Higher up to two, we have a smaller circle, so on and so on and so forth. So putting all this together, our, both of our traces and our level curves, we've got this idea that we've essentially got circles that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we go higher and higher and higher. That's the idea. So if I was trying to actually graph this, I would probably just do something like that. So my final kind of graph here would be I know that two is kind of the cutoff, so two this way. And I probably wouldn't actually mark the twos in the x direction. I would just do two that way and kind of eyeball it. So I know that this is kind of my, my cylinder of asymptotes. This cylinder here is, right, that's, we can't get any closer to that. And then we've got kind of our function doing this, it's doing this. And then it's revolving around. It's also doing that in the X direction. The X direction is a little bit harder. Yeah, a lot harder. It's not too shabby. It's in the X direction. And then also you know, over that way. That's kind of what that would look like. Maybe one more level curve if you really like. That one, uh, I feel like that one kind of ruined it. Oh. So this is how you might graph a thing. You might, now I, I feel like we did a lot of extra detail work here that might not have been necessary, but when you're graphing a thing, finding the traces in each of the planes that we can, and then level curves is kind of a, I don't want to say standard, but a typical way of trying to do it. Questions, comments? Has he said anything about like the expectations around graphing? It's okay if he hasn't. I just I'm curious. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm just wondering what the I want I'm curious if your exam is gonna have any three-dimensional graphing on it. Like one would think so because it's kind of most of what we've talked about so far, but it's hard to say. How helpful of him. <laughs> I imagine I think we taught this class before. Have we not? I don't know. I, I don't know. Why anyway. Other questions or comments before we move on to the next thing? Okay. Um, oh, FYI, in case you're curious, I have office hours after class today, but they're going to be in the room over there at 3218 because things got moved around. So. All right. Let's talk about partial derivatives, which, although they might sound challenging, they are not. If you know how to find a regular derivative, you know how to find a partial derivative. You just don't know you know it yet. So, I do like to talk about this in the context of what they actually mean. So let's draw ourselves one of my favorite three-dimensional surfaces, an upside down paraboloid of x, y equal to nine minus x squared minus y squared. Or as I might encourage you to think about this if you were having to deal with it, like actually graph it, I might think of this as f of x, y equal to nine minus the unit x squared plus y squared. It's very useful to think of that as kind of one thing because notably, it is notable, we'll point out that x squared plus y squared is always non-negative. So I know that this function here, before I even do anything else, the biggest this function can ever be, the, the highest value in the range is nine. I can't get any higher than nine because this inside here will never be negative and nine minus something that's always zero or positive is going to be smaller than or equal to nine. 
Similarly, this can be as negative as I want it to be. Because x squared plus y squared can be super duper big, and nine minus it will be super duper negatively big. So graphing this, I'm going to graph my traces. That's kind of a lie. I'm going to graph one of my traces. I really, really, really like to graph the yz trace. That's the one that's already sitting like on the piece of paper. It's the easiest for me to draw. Unless you do it the other weird way, which I think he does, like where you have x and y kind of going that way. Oh, well. You don't have to do it the way he's doing it unless, I mean, I guess you could say you have to do it this way, but I don't think you would. So here's my parabola going down in the yz plane. It's nine minus y squared. And then instead of drawing the one in the xz plane, trying to make it match up, I'm going to draw the circle that I know I'm going to get in the xz plane. Sorry, the yz plane. And then draw the trace in the x and z plane. So there is my part of my parabola, right? I didn't draw all of it. It keeps going down. I just kind of cut it off at the x, y plane. So technically, right, it's still going that way, that way. I never stop. What we're going to do is we're going to take a level curve. Let's say we want to find, let's look at the level curve. Um, C equal to four. If I plug in C equal to four, I get four equal to nine minus X squared minus Y squared. And solving for X squared plus Y squared, I get X squared plus Y squared on the left equal to nine minus four on the right. There's a circle of radius square root of five. So all that's really saying is if I go up to a height of four, I'm trying to make four, five, six, seven, eight, sure, sure, whatever. That's about four-ish. Sorry, I apologize for my not awesome graphing skills. Here's my level curve at a height of four. So I really want to point out that level curve at a height of four is just the circle, right? If I actually graph that, right, here's my x, y plane, and here's my circle of radius square root of five. This is at c equal to four. Sometimes you graph just the level curve in the x, y plane. Sometimes you like to graph it on the surface itself. Okay. So then let's actually look at the point on the surface, and let me try and graph it here. We're going to go one in the x direction, two in the y direction, and then four in the z direction, right up to there. So right there, there's the point one comma two comma four. So here's the question we're going to ask. From that point, that is one forward and two to the right, and four up, if I walk in the positive X, so if I'm standing, like, pretend this is like a mountain. I'm standing on some mountain that's very nice to see. And I start walking in the positive X direction. So I'm at this point here and I start going forward towards you. Am I gonna be going up the mountain or down the mountain? Think about it for a second. I know my grinds are not perfect, but we're kind of we're kind of in front of the peak of the mountain already, right? The peak is right here, and I've moved. If you go directly below it, I've moved us one forward, and then two to the right, and then four up. So I'm definitely forward of the peak, and if I move in that forward direction, I'm going to be going downward. So. What I would imagine here is that the slope of the peak in the forward direction is going to be negative. If I'm moving downward, the slope of the peak is a negative slope. We're going to calculate that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, in fact, let me help draw it by drawing a little bit more of this picture here. Maybe. We'll see here. It'll work out. Come on. You can do it. It's always it's always challenging here. Oh, I think I kind of lost it there. 
So here's kind of the line, or I should say really the plane where y is equal to two. Along this whole thing here, right? I'm always two to the right on this whole part of the plane here. So what I'm saying is from here, I'm gonna be moving in that direction, which looks like I'm definitely going down. All right, so in this direction, in the forward X direction, at the point two comma one comma four, sorry, not two comma one comma four, one comma two comma four, what is the slope? Well, here's the nice thing. At this point, Y is constant, or I should say in this direction, Y is constant. Right? If I move forward, I'm not moving left or right. The Y value is being held as, as a constant value of two. So what we're gonna do here is we say, well, I can take the derivative of this function by just saying, I'm really looking at this. Of x comma two is nine minus x squared minus two squared, which is really five minus x squared. We'll point out this blue parabola here really is five minus x squared. If we take the derivative of that, which I'm going to write as f sub x, that derivative is negative 2x. And then if we want to plug in the point 1 comma 2, there's nowhere to plug in the y coordinate. So if I plug in the x coordinate, I get negative 2 times 1, which is negative 2. So here's the result. The slope at this point in the positive x direction is negative 2. Now, I also want to mention here that I didn't actually have to plug in y equal to 2 to do this. Because when you're taking the partial derivative with respect to x, you're treating every other variable as if they were a constant. So if I was going to say I've got f of x, y equal to 9 minus x squared minus y squared, I could jump straight to saying fx, derivative of 9 is 0, the derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of y squared is, well, as far as x is concerned, y is a constant. And the derivative of y squared is going to be 0. And that's something I would encourage you all to take to heart. When we find partial derivatives with respect to a specific variable, you are always imagining that the, any other variable is a constant and it gets treated like one. So if you have a constant square, its derivative is zero because we are only moving in the direction where y is constant. If we're moving this way, the y values never change. So y really is what we could also ask. What's the derivative if I move in the y direction? Or what's the slope if I move in the y direction? So the slope in the y direction at the same point, one comma two comma four. Well, we would find the partial derivative with respect to y. So fy would be, well, if the function is nine minus x squared minus y squared, fy is gonna be zero minus zero minus two y. Because now x is getting treated like a constant, which is just negative 2y. And so fy evaluated at the point 1, 2 is going to be negative 2 times 2, which is negative 4. A steeper slope. It's still a negative slope. So I'll point out, if you go back to our picture here, what we're seeing here is now instead of moving forward, you're moving to the right. You're going down at a steeper slope. I didn't draw it very steeply, though. All right. You got something kind of like that. The picture was good, and I think I kind of ruined it. Oh, well. So still going down, still have a negative slope with the steeper slope. Cool. A um, couple of notation things. When you're finding the partial derivative, with respect to x. There's a couple ways of writing it. 
Uh, people often like the F sub X, or we just say FX notation because it's easy to write, but it's also accurate to, to write del F del X. I want to point out, I did say del there, I didn't say D. So the del shape, okay, it's not really important. It looks practically the same. No one really is ever going to notice if you've written a del or a D. But the del is a, like a curlier version of a D. So it's kind of like, I didn't probably draw it curly enough. It's kind of like that. So, so del X versus DX. So we use a del for a partial derivative and a D for a regular derivative. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but I just want to say there is a notational difference here. And then similarly, partial derivative with respect to Y would be FY or del F del Y. So kind of a bit of explaining there. I really do did want you to have an idea of what a partial derivative really means. In practice, calculating them is not terrible. So for example, let's say we had f of x comma y equal to x to the fourth plus y cubed plus x squared times y to the fifth. And I want to find the partial derivatives. Okay. Time to remind ourselves, in fact, let's, let's take a quick, I'm just going to go quick to the side here for a second. Oh, not there. So just as a point of interest, just in case you all remember, let me ask you a quick question. If my function f of x was, say, I don't know, 6 plus 3, not 3, yeah, sure, fine, 3, 3x squared, I do not love, my, I'm already regretting my choice here. Let's make that 13. What's the derivative? Well, the derivative of 6 is 0, and the derivative of 13x squared is 26x. The point I'm trying to make here is that when you have a constant all by itself, the derivative is 0. On the other hand, if your function was, say, I don't know, 6 times sine of x, the derivative is going to be 6 times cosine of x. Or in other words, if you have a constant multiple of a function, that constant hangs out. It doesn't go away. Its derivative is not zero. If you prefer, you could think of this as a prodigal kind of situation and say the derivative is the derivative of six times sine plus six times the derivative of sine. And that gets you to the same place. The end result, though, is still that when you have a constant multiple of a function of your variable, the derivative of that whole thing, the constant multiple hangs out, sticks around. Okay, so that said, now back to our example. If I want to find the partial derivative with respect to x, well, the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. The derivative of y cubed is zero. And the derivative of x squared times y to the fifth, well, y to the fifth is acting like a constant multiple. So the derivative of x squared times y to the fifth, excuse me, is going to be 2x times y to the fifth. Because we take the derivative of the function and we leave the constant multiple as is. Okay, I want you all in a similar way, and then we could simplify this. I don't, I wouldn't really write the zero there if I was writing the answer, but I would finalize this as 4x cubed plus 2x times y to the fifth. Okay, I would like you all to, in the same way, find del f del y. I'll give you a, a minute. So give a minute, I say a minute. 
All right, close enough. So here, the partial derivative of this function with respect to y, the derivative of x to the fourth is zero. The derivative of y cubed is three y squared. The constant multiple x squared is gonna hang out and the derivative of y to the fifth is five y to the fourth. And then I would simplify this as three y squared plus, I bring out the constant at five in front because it's just normal. I'd write it as five x squared y to the fourth. We can also take, and we will need to take, second partial derivative. So I can find, so it's really not lovely using this notation. So I can find the second partial derivative of f with respect to x. Or if you prefer, and I kind of do prefer, you can write this as fxx. And that's just going to be the partial with derivative with respect to x of the partial derivative with respect to x, right? It's just like taking a normal second derivative. So here that's just going to be the derivative with respect to x of 4x cubed plus 2xy to the fifth. And we're going to apply our normal differentiation rules. So the derivative of 4x cubed is 12x squared. The derivative of 2x times y to the fifth, well, the y to the fifth is still just acting like a constant multiple. The derivative of 2x is 2. So you're going to get 2 times y to the fifth. Please stop me or say something if you have questions. I don't think this stuff is like too, too terrible, but if I'm overlooking something or you feel like I'm, something could be clarified, let me know. All right, I made you do it before. I'm gonna make you do it again. I want you all to find the second partial derivative with respect to y. So del squared f of del y squared, or if you prefer, f y y, which is just a partial with respect to y of your partial with respect to y. We start talking about second partial derivatives, which. Yeah, no, oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. So we took the second partial with respect to x, we did the derivative with respect to x again, and now we're doing the second partial with respect to y. We're taking the derivative of the derivative with respect to y with respect to y again. So here's the first derivative with respect to y. It was 3y squared plus 5y squared y to the fourth. I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to y again. The derivative of 3y squared is 6y. 5x squared is acting like a constant here, but it's going to hang out. You got 5x squared times the derivative of y to the fourth is 4y cubed. For me, I like to simplify this. 5 times 4 is 20. I can write this as 20x squared y cubed. Also of interest, we can take what's called the mixed second partial derivative, where you do the derivative with respect to x first and then with respect to y second, or vice versa. Let's see what happens. So, okay, now here's, a, here's something I should point out that's terrible notationally. And I'm sorry, I didn't design it. It's not my fault. But for whatever reason, well, no, there's good reasons. Um, if I want to find the mixed partial with respect to x first and then y second, I'm going to write it as del squared f del y del x. That means x first, y second. Now that's not terrible in and of itself, but the problem is if you use the other notation, the subscript notation, we would write this as f x y, which means x first and then y second. Yeah, right. Because that is the way, that is the convention for this notation. Here, because when you write the derivative notation like this, we read from right to left. So what this actually means over here, which I'm going to write down here, is del squared f del y del x really means the derivative with respect to y of the derivative of f with respect to x. So you're doing the derivative with respect to x first, and then the derivative with respect to y of that after. Now, well, there's some good news in store, which we'll hold on to in just a minute. 
So let's see, that's gonna be the derivative with respect to y of my partial with respect to x, which was four x cubed plus two x y to the fifth. Okay, let me ask everybody, what's the derivative with respect to y of four x cubed? Big old zero. And then for two x y to the fifth, the two x is gonna hang out and the derivative of y to the fifth is gonna be a five y to the fifth. And I certainly would prefer to simplify this as 10 times x times y to the fifth. On the other side of things, we can do the other mixed partial, the del squared f del x del y, which is the same as f y x, which is also to be written as del del x of del f del y. Now in practice, when I see this or this, I'm just gonna take the derivative with respect to y first and then take the derivative of that with respect to x second. So here I'm gonna have del del x of my del f del y, I forgot what it was. Let me go back and look. My del f del y was three y squared plus five x squared y to the fourth. Okay, the partial derivative with respect to x of three y squared is gonna be zero. Partial with respect to x of five x squared times y to the fourth is gonna be five times two x times y to the fourth. Right, the constants hang out and the derivative of x squared is two x. And then if we simplify this, we get 10 x times y to the fourth. And I would hope, I would note, those are the same. Now, are they always the same? No. But are they always the same in this class? Yeah. So it, it's true that, or it's not true that the mixed partials in either order are always equal to each other. There's something called Clairaud, Clairou, I don't know how to pronounce it, Clairaud's theorem. I, I can write it down. However, you say this name, theorem says when these are equal to each other. And the, the nice thing is that these mixed partials are gonna be equal to each other for any kinds of functions that we encounter in this class. You have to make up, like I can later on, if you really, really care, I can, I'll post on Canvas an example of like the simplest function where this condition fails. It's not a simple function. It's some weird piecewise thing that you have to like make up specifically so that this thing doesn't work. And that's the easiest one. So. All the functions we encounter in this class are relatively normal. They're just like X's and Y's thrown together. You know, like piecewise stuff. So we can always expect, although you might be asked to show that the mixed partial in either direction does equal the same thing, which is nice. It's also nice because we're going to use it a lot actually when we start testing to see if something is a maximum or a minimum or a saddle point of a surface. So the reason we're really talking about these mixed partials is because lit in like a class or two, we're going to test to see if something is a max or a min by calculating the second derivative with respect to x, the second derivative with respect to y, and the mixed partial derivative, and then calculating something and seeing if it's positive or negative, we get a max or a min or a solid point, things like that. So that's why we are talking about this, because we're actually about to use it for something. Let's look at a couple more examples. Mm, how many time we got? Not a lot of time. Well, not that example. Not those examples. Jeez. Sorry. Let's go this way. Let's say, yeah. Let's say our function is f of x comma y equal to x to the fourth plus y to the third plus four x y squared minus sine of x cubed. Someone might ask you to find all six first and second derivatives, meaning the first derivative is with respect to y and with respect to x, and then all the second partials, x, x, y, y, and both x, y, and y. Okay, here is how I would do this. I'm going to find fx. It's going to be 4x cubed plus 0 plus 4 times y squared minus cosine of x cubed times x 3x squared. So I got to use the chain rule there. Not throw that. And then over here, I do Fy. Fy is going to be 3y squared. And then plus a 4x times 2y is going to be an 8xy. Great. 
Now I'm going to find the second partial is fxx and fyy. And I'm just going to do it right below this. So fxx, I'm just going to take the derivative of this with respect to x again. I'm going to get a 12x squared. The derivative of 4y squared is zero. I don't really need to write zero, but you can write zero if you want to. Minus, I'm going to have to use a product rule here. So it's going to be the derivative of cosine of x cubed, which is negative sine of x cubed times 3x squared times the other 3x squared. All right, if you're thinking of this as your g and this is your h, here is your g prime, here is your h. Plus then the first function left alone times the derivative of the second function. That's kind of gross. Fortunately, the second partial with respect to y is much nicer or much simpler. Fyy is just going to be 6y plus 8x. Derivative of 3y squared is 6y. Derivative of 8y is 8, and then the x just hangs in there. Okay, now for the mixed partials. So for fxy, I'm really just I'm looking back at fx. Saying, okay, from there, take the derivative with respect to y. So the derivative of 4x cubed is 0. The derivative of 4y squared is 8y. The derivative of cosine of x cubed times 3x squared is, how lovely, 0. That's a pretty nice. And then we shouldn't even really have to, but I'm going to check that the mixed partial, the other direction, is the same value. So again, I'm taking now, I'm taking my Fy and I'm differentiating with respect to X. So I'm going to get, let's see, derivative of three Y squared is zero. Derivative of eight X Y is eight times one times Y. Eight Y. So yeah, my mixed partials either order should always end up being the same. Okay, let's do one more. I just want to say more. So most of the time in this class, we're just going to deal with functions of two variables and take the mixed partials that way. But technically, you could have a function of as many variables as you wanted. For example, I could say f of x comma y comma w is x cubed times sine of 3y plus w squared. And then I could ask for a lot of different mixed partials. And also, you can tack on as many additional derivatives as you want. Yeah, right. For, for this one here, it should, well, it should be the same as that one there. So again, I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to x. Derivative of 3y squared is 0. And the derivative of 8x is 8 times 1. And the y is the constant that's hanging and for this one, we can do all of the different mixed or all the different first partials. We could find del f del x. And let's say that's going to be 3x squared times that constant, right? Here, if I'm thinking of x as the variable, x cubed is my variable, and sine of all this is just a constant. I'm happy about. It's perfectly fine to write this as fx if you prefer. Both notations are widely accepted. I can't imagine your teacher would say you have to use one over the other. Um, then del f del y is going to be a little more complicated. The x cubed now is acting like a constant. And the derivative of sine of some stuff is going to be cosine of the stuff times the derivative of the inside, which is just 3 plus 0. And then del f del w. Well, again, the x cubed is acting like a constant. And the derivative sine of some stuff is, again, cosine of the stuff. But now when we multiply by the derivative of the inside stuff, instead of getting the derivative of 3y being 3, we're getting the derivative of w squared being 2w. So we're differentiating with respect to w. All right, that's enough for today.